What a cute little baby. Is probably not what you think right now. I find this robot baby rather creepy, to be honest, and chances are high you do too. Scientists call this particular emotional reaction the uncanny valley effect. Very simply put, the uncanny valley effect describes a negative human reaction to an object that resembles a human too much. One, two, three, four. You might have heard the term uncanny valley before. It's a passionately debated topic, even in pop culture. And the uncanny valley could have a big impact on our future. Apart from humanoid robots, it also plays a big role in the gaming sector and in the movie business. So I wanted to know, what is the uncanny valley exactly? Why is it there? And why does it matter? Let's find out. Bukimi no Tani Gensho, the Uncanny Valley. The term was first used in 1970 by Japanese robotics professor Masahiro Mori. Based on his research in the field of human-robot interactions, he developed the following thesis. As the appearance of a robot is made more human, some observers' emotional response to the robot becomes increasingly positive and empathetic, until it reaches a point beyond which the response quickly becomes strong revulsion. However, as the robot's appearance continues to become less distinguishable from a human being, the emotional response becomes positive once again and approaches human-to-human -human empathy levels. Or very simply put, this robot, not creepy, this robot, very creepy. In case you wondered, the valley in Uncanny Valley is this drop of the graph. And by the way, this is what a Bunraku puppet looks like. Please keep in mind, it's just a theory. In 1970, it was simply not possible to manufacture a robot that resembled a human enough to prove it. If you ask me, it's still not possible today. Even though some scientists say otherwise, but more on that later. It took eight years before Masahiro Mori's concept received international attention. In 1978, it was first quoted as the Uncanny Valley in an international publication. The reason it took off afterwards was the word uncanny. It unintentionally linked Mori's findings to a classic of Western psychology, Sigmund Freud's essay, The Uncanny. Starting from there, a lot of research was done on the topic and in a much broader context than just robots. Scientists began to explore the very particular uncanny feeling from an evolutionary perspective. Some went so far as to compare monkeys' reactions to photos of real monkeys and artificially altered ones. Being afraid of a snake is a reflex. It's in our genes. And it makes sense. In case the snake is poisonous, that emotional reaction could save your life. But why should we have the same feeling if a robot looks too much like a human? Is the robot a danger to us? Why don't we trust it? Here are three interesting scientific ideas. Mate selection. Some scientists claim that once a robot looks too human-like, we subconsciously start to check if it could be a possible mate. But with their weird-looking skin and their often clumsy movements, they don't seem like good partners to produce healthy babies with. And so, without consciously knowing why, we reject them. Mortality salience. Other studies come to the conclusion that uncanny robots remind us of our own mortality. Especially images of partially disassembled androids seem to play on subconscious fears of reduction, replacement and annihilation. Violation of human norms. Also very interesting is this theory. If a robot looks non-human enough, we still notice its human characteristics and we react with empathy. However, if the robot looks almost human, it becomes the subject of the same normative expectations we have towards other humans. And falling into this category, we start to find its behavior strange. In other words, we no longer judge the robot by the standards of a robot doing a passable job at pretending to be human, but we instead judge it by the standards of a human doing a terrible job at acting like a normal person. So, the uncanny valley theory in a way touches the core of what's human and what's not. But that's all crazy theories, you might say. What does that have to do with real life? A lot. 
passing the uncanny valley is something the gaming and the movie industry alike have been trying to achieve for years. Here's why. The more realistic animated characters in games or movies appear, the more likely we are to react emotionally to their stories. And more emotions from us, that's the assumption, lead to more money in the producers' pockets. Only a couple of years ago, most lifelike computer-generated characters definitely fell into the category uncanny. But there have been impressive improvements. Current games already get very close to feeling real. And in movies, late actors have been successfully brought back to life with the help of CGI. And while doing that definitely has a creepy aspect, the results didn't look creepy at all. Things are a bit different in the field of robotics. Developers of humanoid robots hope that creations will play a vital part in future societies. But if we are to interact with robots in an effective way, they shouldn't creep us out. That's why a lot of developers rely on cute-looking robots, like this fella. Pepper might be the world's most famous robot in service, doing different jobs from working as a receptionist to giving workouts in elderly care. But leading roboticists say that being cute is not enough. Professor Hiroshi Ishiguro is probably the most renowned roboticist worldwide. Listen to what he has to say on that topic. Actually, you know, the uh, human brain has a many functions to recognize humans. Therefore, you know, human-like appearance in human-like android, human-like voice and movement is easy for, under uh, you know, for understanding. So we can naturally react to the human-like robots. If we want to use the uh, android as a receptionist, so probably we're going to choose the more human-like robots. So interaction is usually very short, but just a 10 seconds. In such case, I think, uh, you know, the human-like a robot is better than the uh, you know, different types of a robot. He might have a point there. By the way, the lady sitting next to him is called Erika. She is widely regarded as the most advanced humanoid robot yet. If you want to find out more about her, just click the link here. But how is Professor Ishiguro going to make sure Erika doesn't freak people out? Basically, you know, the, our android is not uncanny anymore. The uh, reaction of people is, is getting uh, very natural. It's just, uh, you know, the problem with education, the experience. To be honest, I still found Erika rather creepy. She reminded me a lot of a talking mannequin. But compared to another famous android I was able to meet, she came across... okay. Talking to Sophia, a creation from Hong Kong-based company Hanson Robotics, really freaked me out. You can find out more about her here. Maybe I'm just too old to ever be able to interact with robots in a natural way. Another scientific study suggests that the uncanny valley may be generational. Younger generations, more used to CGI robots and such, may be less likely to be affected by it. Do you think we'll see life like androids soon? And is it really a good idea to give humanoid robots jobs that could also be done by humans? Would you feel comfortable in the company of an android? Let us know in the comments. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. That's it from me. Take care. Bye bye.